بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين <تصفيق> والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <تصفيق> إن شاء الله let us uh, begin so the title for today's درس or today's lecture is working yeah? okay uh, the title, inshallah, for today's lecture, today's dars, inshallah, is uh, Victory is Close. Ramadan, being a blessed month, being a month of great victories. Inshallah ta'ala, we pray and we hope that this Ramadan will be another month of great victories. Many people may ask the question that how, where, or when is this victory going to take place? When, when we look around the Muslim world, we see nothing but destruction or death. And even one may even say is that how is it possible that you know, Muslims will see victory when we really command no authority, we really command no power, you know, weapons, armies, nuclear powers are not in their hands. How is it that we are claiming that victory is close or victory is coming. Therefore, in order to answer that question, we need to take a little journey through history. And then inshallah, towards the end, we'll be able to answer the question by understanding our history. A short journey which will remove any of our doubts or any feelings of despair, any feelings of despondency, you'll come to realize that actually victory is very, very close. Because number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who promises the victory. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His promises are always true. As Allah he says, Fasbir inna wa'adallahi haq. O people, be patient. For verily the promises of Allah Almighty are true. When we look through history, the calamities, the difficulties, the problems that this ummah has gone through have been very, very catastrophic to say the least. And some would say that they're actually more painful and more difficult than what the Ummah is going through right now. But these difficulties and these tasks, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us how the Ummah overcomes them and how they become strong. And it is our duty as Muslims to understand that our deen, the deen of Islam, is a deen which is meant to be propagated, a deen which is meant to rise to the top, a deen which Allah Almighty has commanded us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has commanded us and he has sent to us the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he has come to us with huda, with guidance, the Qur'an, deen al-haq, the truth. Why has he come with this truth? Allah, he says, liyudhirahu, that he has come in order to make it apparent, make it, make it clear make it dominant over all other ways of life. Allah, he says, لِيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى دِينِ كُلِّهِ Among all other ways of life, Islam has to be number one. This is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, this is your duty, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and those who follow in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَلَوْ كَرِهَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ Even if the pagans dislike it. It doesn't matter. It's your job to take the deen and to elevate it above everything else. Likewise, when we look through history, we'll come to find examples of this. In the early stages of da'wah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in the early Meccan phase or the Meccan phase, we come to find that the hostility towards the Prophet and his companions was intense. The persecution was intense. The imprisonment and the killing was intense. And the Prophet وسلم, was called all names. He was mocked, he was ridiculed, he was called a liar, he was called a poet. He was called a madman, he was called all kinds of things. But Allah says, إِنَّهُ لَقَوْلُ رَسُولٍ كَرِيمٍ But what the Prophet ﷺ says is, is he is a true messenger of God. وَمَا هُوَ بِقَوْلِ شَاعِرٍ قَلِيلًا مَا تُؤْمِنُونَ It is not the word of a poet, but they just don't understand. وَلَا بِقَوْلِ كَاهِنٍ And he is not a magician. قَلِيلًا مَا تَذَكَّرُونَ And very little is it that people truly reflect. Rather his message, تَنْزِيلٌ مِنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ His message is coming from the Most High. And coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala into the message for mankind. So these accusations that were placed upon the Prophet from very early on, 
And they continue even to this day when people or the media addresses Muslims, they will always address them in this, this kind of language. Now, because Brahma says, when we look at the early years of the Prophet وسلم, some of the most difficult moments I would like to highlight to you and show you how Allah brought victory. We know in the early years, the Prophet وسلم and his companions, they were ostracized, they were boycotted, they were thrown into the valley for up to three years. The community completely cut off from the Prophet ﷺ and his followers and abandoned them to live in a valley, hoping for them to suffocate, hoping them for no food, no drink, and they will slowly just disappear. Either they will change their tone or they will just disappear. This was <coughs> the threat that was given to them. And we find there are a number of narrations in this that we find that the Prophet ﷺ informs us that many a time went by where the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, they had no food to eat. They had nothing to drink and they had no food to eat. On one occasion, it is mentioned that 30 days, he says, passed by. And me and Bilal, we had no food to eat except very little. The Prophet actually says, لَقَدْ أَتَتْ عَلَيَّ ثَلَثُونَ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَوْمٍ وَلَيْلَ 30 days passed by us. وَمَالِي وَلِبِلَالِ طَعَامُ وَيَأْكُلُهُ ذُو كِبِتْ And we, me and Bilal passed by 30 days in which <coughs> there was no food that was consumable by a human being which means they were eating things that humans don't eat. And they are, <coughs> the, this is the Prophet Sallallahu who is the best of mankind. And while we're talking about all of these events, I want you to uh, always understand what is going on in the world today and relate and see how things work. And that is why we're saying victory is coming close. That here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and Bilal, they went 30 days without any food that is consumed by human beings. إِلَّا شَيْءٌ يُوَارِهِ إِبِطُ Bilal. The Prophet accept that bit of food which we were able to hide under the armpit of Bilal. Bilal was an ex-slave. So he was able to hide a little bit of food under his armpit and bring it. And through that, me and Bilal, we ate like that for 30 days. These are the difficulties that they went to. Hadith can be found in the Sahih of Imam Tirmidhi. So these are the kind of struggles that during the three years went by like that. The companions also went through the toughest of times. When we look at the life of the best of the companions, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, that he was beaten severely to the point that the narrations tell us he was beaten in front of the Kaaba and he was beaten so severely you couldn't even recognize his face. Many a times we find that even Omar being the great man that he is, he was ganged upon and he was also beaten severely. Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, it is reported that he was once tied up and he was also beaten severely. They went through great hardship in order for us to bring us this Islam. One of the earlier Muslims, an ex-slave, his name is Khabab ibn Arat. And he was a, one of the first 10 Muslims uh, people to accept Islam. And he was an ex-slave. And when he embraced Islam, his owner, they would persecute him. And they would take coal and they would burn it until it was very, very hot. Or take rods and burn them until they're very, very hot. And then they would put them on his back. And then they would burn his back and they would pull it as they're burning his back. Which left marks and holes on his back. And in the Khilafah of Omar, some of the companions, they would sit and they would talk about the struggles they went through in order for them to in, enjoy the Khilafah or the blessed days that they're enjoying now. While people were talking about the uh, difficulties that they went through, Khabab ibn Arat, he didn't talk, he simply lifted up his shirt and he showed them his back. And Omar, when he saw his back, Omar burst into tears and started to cry. Because you could see the holes, you could see the marks on the backs of these people they had gone through in order to maintain La ilaha illallah. Likewise, brothers and sisters, Bilal, we need no introduction into Bilal. Bilal was one who was also an ex-slave who embraced Islam and his master would torture him. And one of the ways in which they used to torture the early Muslims was they used to take them out in the daytime, in the peak of the heat, and they used to tie them up and make them lie down on the desert sand. I don't know if anybody has ever been, or most of you have probably been for Umrah or Hajj or been to the Arab world. You, you can't even walk out into the desert. If you dropped an egg, it would fry immediately on that sand. It is that hot. And we go out to do ziyara, And it's funny because sometimes we go to the visit mountain Uhud or other places. Our taxi driver is waiting at the bottom with the air conditioning on. We run up to see the mountain Uhud and we run back down into the car. It is that hot. Imagine these people, they were put on that heat and they were there for hours. And Bilal wasn't just put on there, lying there for hours, but also they took boulders, rocks to place on their backs, to place on their stomachs. And they were beaten on top of that. And they were forced to say words of kufr, but they didn't. They said what? Ahad. 
Ahad. They say one God, one God. And that is the struggles that they went through. Likewise, if we continue looking some of the earlier reverts who came to Islam, and they were also ex-slaves, was Yasir and his wife Sumayya. These two embraced Islam very early on. And Abu Jahl being the Jahil that he was, he would take them out into the open desert and he would torture them. It is said that he would tie them up in the style of a crucifixion, tie them up in the heat and he used to beat them and he used to torture them and he used to force them to say words of kufr, but they didn't do so. Ammar bin Yasir, the son of Yasir and Sumayya was also tortured and he would see his own mother and his own father being beaten and being tortured in front of his own eyes. But they had strength because the Prophet on one occasion, he said to them prior to them being tortured in this way, he said to them, Sabran ala Yasir. He said, Oh family Yasir, have patience. Why? He said, For inna mawidakum al jannah. Because you as a family, you are promised paradise. Because of the struggles that they went through. And it was the father, Yasir, who was tortured, but he wasn't killed at that moment. Likewise, Ammar bin Yasir was tortured, but he wasn't killed at that moment because they said things that got them away from the torment. They said things that pleased the, the Abu Jahl and he didn't touch them. He, they managed to get away. But Sumayya, the mother of Ammar, she was resilient and she did not compromise in her wording. And it is mentioned in some of the narration that she stood in the face of Abu Jahl who was beating her and he, she spat at him and she said to him, I will never say the words that you are saying. And it was upon that moment that he took a spear. And in some narrations it mentions that he took a spear and he stabbed her in her private parts and he killed her. This is the struggle that these people, they went through. This is what they had to go through in order for them to maintain the Islam and for us to enjoy the Islam that we are enjoying today. Brothers and sisters, likewise in the battle of Badr, when Abu Jahl was killed, the Prophet ﷺ, he approached Ammar bin Yasir. And upon approaching Ammar and they saw Abu Jahl lying there, he said, Allah has killed your mother's killer today. Uh, avenge the death of the person that killed your mother. So it was remembered. Likewise, when the Muslims, were very few in number in the early part of the Meccan period where the persecution was intense. When it becomes when it becomes very intense, many of the companions they fled and they made the first hijra. Where did they go? What was the first hijra to? Habasha. Very good. Yeah. So they went to Africa. They went to Habasha, and that is where the first group of Muslims they went and they were looked after there. They were protected. Their families were kept safe. The people they fled the persecution and they stayed. And those Muslims that stayed behind, they went through even more difficulty. They couldn't come out of their houses because of the persecution that was taking place. Now, what's interesting is at this moment, some of the companions, they came to the Prophet ﷺ and they said, Ya Rasulullah, Ala tad'u lana, Ala tastansur lana. They said, Oh Prophet of God, look what we're going through. Are you not going to make dua for us? Are you not going to ask Allah to give us victory? And the Prophet ﷺ, he was leaning on the wall and he came forward and you could see his face became red and he became very serious. He said, Wallahi la yatim manna had al amr, hatta yasir al rakibu min sanai ila hadramot, la yahafu illa la, or the eba al ghanami, walakin nakum tastajilun. The Prophet ﷺ, he responded to the question and he said to them that Wallahi, this amr, meaning Islam, it is going to be complete. It is going to be victorious. To the point where a rakib, a traveler from Sana'a, this is Yemen, will travel all the way to Hadramaut. And he will fear nothing, meaning he will live in peace, meaning Islam will be victorious, except that he will fear Allah or a dhib or a wolf that may attack his sheep. And he says, وَلَكِنَّكُمْ تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ But you are hasty. Now, I want you to remember these words. I'm, I've picked everything today uh, on purpose, that the Muslims are going through the most amount of torture. They're going through the most amount of difficulty, the most amount of persecution. The most amount of what you can, you know, what you're seeing on your phones and what you're hearing and what you're seeing on the TV, the most amount, the most severe forms of difficulty. And when they came to the process of help, the Prophet responded back to them and said, You're being hasty. Victory is coming. And you will walk free from Sana'a all the way to Hadramaut. Now, if you were to pose that to any political uh, analyst today and give that cancer, they think you're crazy. They think, oh, sir, What's this man talking about? You guys are. Uh, you know, being imprisoned, running out of the country, you've got no food, you've been abandoned. Where is that victory going to come from? But the Prophet of God, Allah, he tells them, you're being hasty. Just wait. We will be victorious and you will go from Sana all the way to Hadramaut. And was it not only a few years later that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
established the deen of Islam? Was it not just a few years later that we find that Islam went all the way to China? That a few years later we find Islam reached all the way into the doors of Europe, one kilometer away from Paris in Spain? Is it not it's soon after that we found that Islam it went into Central Africa and into South Africa and Islam it spread everywhere? Allah promised that victory. The Prophet promised that victory, but there was some patience and there was a short amount of time that they had to wait. What's also very interesting, brothers and sisters, is that from the death of the Prophet Islam became a superpower. From being unknown, unheard of, just being Bedouins, running around in the desert, to becoming a superpower. And that, from that moment, from the death of the Prophet up until modern times, until modern history, we find that Islam either was the superpower, or it was one of the superpowers in the world. It's only in the last maybe 80 to 100 years that we've got real no power or no strength. And this is something new in our history that we are even learning how to deal with. But it's important to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to victory, Allah chooses the people, Allah chooses the place, and Allah chooses the time and who is going to bring this victory. Likewise today on the, world, on, on the globe, Allah will choose the place, Allah will choose the people, and Allah will also choose the time and when this is going to happen. Let's continue with our journey through history. And let's have a look at the Battle of Uhud. Now we're all aware of what happened in the Battle of Uhud. In the initial part of the battle, the Prophet and the companions are winning the battle. Then the latter part of the battle, in which the archers that came down from the top of the mountain, they disobeyed the commands of the Prophet and they came down for the Ghanima. When they came down from that, Khalid bin Walid, at this time was not a Muslim, he did a U-turn and he came back round. And when he came back round, there was heavy casualties. Up to 70 of the most closest companions of the Prophet were killed. From amongst those was the uncle of the Prophet Hamza and also one of the ambassadors of Islam, Musab ibn Umair. And Hamza was not just killed, but his body was also mutilated as well. So the casualties were immense. And the Prophet ﷺ, not just that, but in the Battle of Uhud, we find narrations where the Prophet ﷺ, he actually, his head was split and the blood poured down from his face. And they had to run up into the mountains with Abu Bakr and Umar and others. They fled up into the mountains. And one of the instances that happened there, Abu Sufyan at that time, as he was leaving, he said something to Abu Bakr. And Abu Bakr, the Prophet ﷺ, don't respond. He said something to Umar. And the Prophet ﷺ don't respond. And then he made a general statement in which he, he said, Lana al Uzza wa la Uzza lakum. We have al Uzza, the God, and this God has given us victory, and you have no God, and your Muhammad is dead. Upon saying that, the Prophet ﷺ then gave the command for a response. And he told him, and they repeated the following, Allahu Mawlana wa la Mawla lakum. Allah is our protector, and you have no protector. And that showed them that soon after that we find that there was victory that came in the hands of the Prophet ﷺ to the believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about the, the incidents that happened in Uhud and the loss that took place. Allah says, أَوَلَمَّ أَصَابَتْكُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَدْ أَصَبْتُمْ مِثْلَيْهَا قُلْتُمْ أَنَّ هَذَا قُلْ هُوَ مِنْ عِنْدِ أَنفُسِكُمْ Allah says that the loss that you experienced in Uhud, it was because of what you did. The people that came down the mountain. And then after facing this loss, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Again, I want you to visualize that the Prophet ﷺ has lost 70 of his best men. They are the most vulnerable and weakest state. They've experienced in this loss. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds back and he says to them, and I say these words. And I want you to remember these words in the current climate as well. Allah he says, وَلَا تَهِنُوا وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا وَأَنْتُمَ الْأَعْلَوْنَ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Allah he says to the people, to the Prophet ﷺ, after the casualties, لا تهنوا, do not despair. ولا تحزنوا, and don't be sad. وأنتم الأعلون, and you are going to be the best, you are going to rise to the top. الأعلى, you are going to rule, you are going to be powerful, and you are going to be strong. You are better than them. And the Allah SWT says, إن كنتم مؤمنين, if you truly have Iman in Allah. Again, if somebody was to hear that, today a political analyst was to look at that, he would say, this commentary is crazy. How can you say you're going to rule the world? How are you going to say you are strong when you've just had the biggest defeat of your career? You just lost all your big men. And you're claiming you're going to be victim. And Allah is saying, and likewise what we see today on our screens, don't grieve. Don't be sad. You are superior than them and you will rise to the top. This is the promise of Allah on one condition. 
in kuntu mu'minin, if you truly are believers. The ayah continues, Allah says, إِنْ يَمْسَسْكُمْ قَرْحٌ فَقَدْ مَسَّ الْقَوْمَ قَرْحٌ مِثْلُ That if you are feeling the pain of the battle, don't forget, they're also feeling the pain, meaning they've also got casualties. تِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ وَلِيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَيَتَّخِذَ مِنْكُمْ شُهَدَاء وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الظَّالِمِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says these are the days. The days rotate. Some days you're up, some days you're down. It's life. Not every day is a victory. Some days are up and some days are down. But why does Allah put you through these tests? Why does Allah put the ummah through these difficulties? Allah he says, وَلِيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا The first part of the test is so Allah he knows who amongst you is a real believer. That's why you have tests. To see who amongst you is a real believer. And number two, Allah he says, وَيَتَّخِذَ مِنْكُمْ شُهَدَاء So Allah he selects from amongst you who is going to be the martyrs. We may see people dying and we may think they're going through difficulty, which they are. But at the same time, Allah is choosing his martyrs, his shuhada. And the shuhada, as we know from the Quran and from the Sunnah, are those that will have no test inside the grave. That will have no hisab on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. From the very first spilling of blood, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises these people, they'll go direct VIP straight into Jannah. This maqam and this position is not earned by anybody. It's not given to anyone. You have to be the best of the best. So Allah, he says, he puts the ummah through these trials, number one, لِيَعْلَمْ To know who is really sincere with their faith. And number two, Allah, he chooses who he wants to be as martyrs. وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الظَّالِمِينَ And Allah, he does not like those who are oppressive and unjust. Further, Allah, he says in the same verse, وَلَيُمَحِّصَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَيَمْحَكَ الْكَافِرِينَ The other reason to why we go through these battles and difficulties is so Allah, he purifies the believers. Because everybody claims to believe. But when you're put to the test, that's when you really know who is the believer. Everyone can claim they believe, but when you're put to the test, you realize this one is a real believer and this one is not. You know, somebody, uh, I'll give you a silly example, but to understand that somebody may claim he's a fighter. You know, I can box, I can wrestle, I can do all these things. But when you put him in the cage or you put him in the ring, you realize who is the real fighter and who isn't. Everybody can claim that they can do things, but when you're put in a situation, you realize who is and who isn't. Allah says likewise that these difficulties, they come in our way in the same way you put in the cage. To see, are you serious? Do you really believe or you don't? When you're tested with your wealth, when you're tested with your time, when you're tested with your life, do you truly believe or not? And then Allah, he concludes this ayah. He says, أَمْ حَسِبْتُمْ أَن تَدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةِ وَلَمَّ يَعْلَمِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا مِنْكُمْ وَيَعْلَمَ الصَّابِرِينَ Allah, he says, do you think, O oh people, that you're just going to enter into paradise? You're just going to walk straight into paradise? You're going to be tested. If you want to get to paradise, you have to earn your way to paradise. You have to work hard to get into paradise. And that working hard is a struggle. And it requires sabr, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. So victory comes, and Allah will give it. Let's have a look at another incident, right? As we're saying, victory is close. And people may question, how is it close? Let's have a look at another incident in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We all know of the Ghazwa Khandaq. Or as in English, say, the Battle of the Trench. Yeah, the Battle of the Trench is called Trench because they built a massive trench on the outskirts of Medina so that the enemies couldn't come in and the trench was dug very deep. The other thing about the Ghazwat al Khandaq is that it is a battle in which the enemies of the Prophet all gathered together from different quarters. They all came together. It is said that up to 10,000 of the enemies of the Prophet they gathered and they agreed and they were standing outside of Medina and they were on the way and they had the <coughs> made the intention that they were going to annihilate the Muslims today. So they were coming from the front. There was a trench that was separating the believers from them. The Prophet ﷺ, when he came into Medina, there were three Jewish tribes that were living inside of Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he came, he made a peace agreement with them. Live as you like, peacefully. Do what you do want to do, we do what we got to do. And he made a peaceful agreement with them. Simply just one agreement that we make, and that is do not commit treason. Yeah, and that's normal. Anybody living in any state, be a Muslim, Christian, Jewish state, one of the conditions, if you want your passport, you've got to give your loyalty to the king or the queen. You've got to show that you're not going to commit treachery. So the same thing with the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to Medina, he made a simple agreement that do not commit treachery and you can live as you like. No problem. You worship, you eat, you do what you like. You do your business, live as you like. And they all made agreements with the Prophet ﷺ that they will protect the Medina, city of Medina and they won't commit treachery. Now, in the battle of the trench, the Prophet ﷺ, he can see 10,000 of his enemies on the other side of the trench. And it's already a very difficult time. The numbers are far great. Then what happens inside? 
Banu Quraida, one of the tribes, committed treachery. They decided to side with the enemies. And the women and the children were left at the back of Medina while the men were at the front. The men were at the front and they had the 10,000 enemies on that side of the trench. And news breaks out that Banu Quraida is attacking our women and children. What do you think was the feeling at that moment in time? Yes, there's a prophet. And yes, they're companions, but they're still human beings. When the, this news broke out, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us about them. إِذْ جَاءُوكُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِكُمْ وَمِنْ أَسْفَلِ مِنْكُمْ وَإِذْ زَاغَتِ الْأَبْصَارُ وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبَ الْحَنَاجِرُ وَتَظَنُّونَ بِاللَّهِ يَظْنُونَ That when the news broke out, Allah he says, وَإِذْ زَاغَتِ الْبَصَرُ Their eyes couldn't believe what they were seeing, meaning they became fearful and they became scared. Allah he says, وَبَلَغَتِ الْقُلُوبَ الْحَنَاجِرُ That their hearts had reached their throat. You know when you're just about to cry and you're, 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 you're struggling to breathe because you're about to cry. Allah is describing the state of the belief. When they heard this news, they said, we're finished. They said, we're done. If they're coming from the front and they're coming from the back and we can't go anywhere else and our women, our children, we're, we're finished, we're destroyed. They thought this was their last day. This is it. This is what is going to happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Allah said, that was the day in which we truly tested the believers. And the test was so severe, Allah he says, وَزُلْزِلُوا زِلْزَالًا شَدِيدًا That it was like a mighty earthquake. That's how severe the test was. Imagine, subhanAllah. Imagine you being in that situation. Allah says the test was so severe. But what is interesting is the following. Imagine how difficult the test was. Imagine knowing you're going to be annihilated from the front. Your women and children are being annihilated in the back. And you're turning to the Prophet and you're saying we're destroyed. At this time, while they were continuing digging the trench and holding their forts, the Prophet ﷺ, they were also striking the rocks, breaking down the rocks from the mountains and putting them into the trench. And one of the rocks, the Prophet ﷺ, he took his axe and he hit the rock. As the Prophet ﷺ hit the rock, he said, Bismillah. And as he said, Bismillah, فَضَرَبَ ضَرْبَةً فَكَسَرَ ثُلُثَهُ A third of the rock broke and fell apart. When a third of it broke, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahu Akbar. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allahu Akbar. He said, أُوْتِيْتُ مَفَاتِحْ شَامْ he said, I have been given the keys of Syria. And just imagine, what's happening in front? What's happening behind? They're facing death in every direction. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I have just been told we're going to conquer Sham. So the Prophet ﷺ, he takes his axe and he, try, he strikes the rock again, the second time. ثُمَّ akbar. A third, the second third fell off. He said, Allahu Akbar. أُوْتِيْتُ مَفَاتِحْ فَارِسْ I've just been promised we're going to conquer Persia. <laughs> this is, who's going to believe this? I've conquered Persia. Then for the third time, Allahu Akbar. He says, Bismillah, فَقَطَ بَقِيَّةَ الْحَجَرِ فَقَالَ اللَّهُ أَكْبَرُ أُوْتِيْتُ مَفَاتِحْ Yemen. I have been given the keys and I will conquer Yemen. Brothers and sisters, I, I, you know, I want you to really think, I, I'm even struggling even saying this. Imagine, subhanAllah, death at the front, death at the back, the Prophet ﷺ is saying, soon we're going to conquer Sham, soon we're going to conquer Persia, and soon we're going to conquer Yemen. Any political analyst to hear that would think, these guys are crazy. This guy, what is he talking about? What does he think he's doing? But those are, those are words that were inspired to the Prophet ﷺ from Allah. That's why when I say to you today, victory is close, I'm not saying it because I'm saying it, I'm saying because Allah said it. That we may not see it, we may not feel it, but we know it's close. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to bring us that victory. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he say? الأحزاب, from amongst the people there who heard what the Prophet said and they saw what was going on, some of them were real believers. And Allah says, الأحزاب, When they saw everything and they heard everything, قالوا, they said, They said, Wallahi, this is what our, our Lord has promised us. And this is what the Prophet has been saying, and Allah never breaks his promise. Do we have that level of Iman? Do we have that level of certainty, even though what we're seeing is what we're seeing, that victory is that close? وَمَا زَادَهُمْ إِلَّا إِيمَانًا وَتَسْلِيمًا And what they saw and what they heard, it did nothing but increase them in Iman and increase them in submission to Allah. What we're saying today, some people, even amongst Muslims, they will start questioning, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ God. They will start saying things that are not befitting to be said about Allah. That's not the way of the believer. The way of the believer is your iman should increase. 
you should become more submissive unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that is what the Sahaba they did. But as you know, in every group, even amongst the Muslims, there are some who are known as the Munafiqun, the hypocrites. And there were those there as well. And when they saw what was taking place, they said, their response was, look at this man. He said, we, he's talking about Persia. He's talking about Yemen. And he's talking about Sham. And we can't even go to the toilet without fearing we're going to be killed. What's this guy talking about? This is the difference between the Mu'min and the Munafiq. The Mu'min has in Iman in Allah that victory is coming. And the Munafiq is one always making 101 excuses and running away. From any opportunity to do any kind of work. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna al-munafiqeena yukhadi'oon Allah wa huwa khadi'uhum. They think they're tricking Allah. But Allah, he knows exactly what they intend. So what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do in this very difficult situation? Allah, he sent down a mighty wind. And that wind was so strong that those 10,000 on the other side of the trench, they couldn't hold up their tents. And discord, argumentation broke out amongst them and they all ran away. So the 10,000 ran away. And those when Quraida who were attempting to kill the women and children at the back, the Muslims were able to retrieve and catch them. And they were also dealt with. That's another piece of history for you to read about. They were also dealt with. The Muslims came out of the battle of Khandak victorious. Was victory close? The victory was close. And Allah showed it was close. Because they had Iman in Allah. And they submitted unto Allah. And they knew that whenever Allah promises something, that the promise is also true. Let's continue a few more. Continue on. We're going very quickly through the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Sulh Hudaybiyyah. In the sixth year of the Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ came out with a, few, with a group of people in Ihram wanting to go to Mecca to perform Umrah. Upon their journey wanting to perform Umrah, they were stopped by the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ and they were confronted that they can't go any further. The Prophet ﷺ agreed and they made a sulh, they made a peace treaty. In that peace treaty, the Prophet ﷺ submitted and agreed to signing conditions that were not what would, one, would, one would see as befitting to be signed by the Prophet ﷺ. People struggled understanding why is the Prophet signing these agreements. One of those, for example, in the letter it said, Min Rasulillah Muhammad ibn Abdullah and so on and so forth. The, the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ said that the condition number one removed the word Rasulullah. Because if we accept that, why would we be fighting you? So remove it. So the Prophet ﷺ, he removed it. And the Khamis said, yeah, well, yeah, you're removing your name off the, uh, off the peace treaty. When you are the Prophet of God, he said, it's okay. That let's fine. The second condition they said, go back home. You're not coming here for Umrah. Imagine you come with Ihram and you've gone all the way there. Mecca is just another, you know, just a few meters away. You can go and perform Umrah. They said, no, come back next year. You can't come this year. The process agreed. Then the third condition, which was the most difficult of those conditions, was that the Quraysh, they said to the Prophet ﷺ, our third condition is, if any of our people, after this agreement, they come to Medina, you have to return them back to us. And if any of your people come to Mecca, we're not going to give them back to you. The Prophet ﷺ agreed. He said, we agree. And the Prophet signed the agreement. The companions who couldn't understand what's going on. Even the Prophet ﷺ, he did because he was informed by Allah. He made the agreement and they didn't understand why. And one of the people that actually spoke out, couldn't control himself was who? Omar couldn't control himself. Ya Rasulullah, alasna ala al-haq wa hum ala al-batil. Are we not on the truth and they're upon the wrong and we're making all the concessions? And the Prophet ﷺ said, this is what have we been ordered to. Shortly after signing the agreement, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Indeed, we have given you the biggest victory. Again, you would think, what? All the compromising done on our side, all of us have to return home with nothing in our hand. But Allah, he responded and he said, indeed, today you've received the biggest victory. That was the sixth year of the Hijrah. In the seventh year of the Hijrah, what did they achieve? Number one, they gained victory over Khaybar. Khaybar was one of the forts of the Yehud. They gained victory over that. So they conquered uh, Khaybar. In the eighth year, the ultimate victory, which was Fath Mecca. They walked back into Mecca and they conquered the whole of Mecca and they conquered the whole of the peninsula. You would think at that time when they're making those concessions in the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, how are these people ever going to come back from that? They've got no power, they've got no authority. But Allah, he said, Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina. 
indeed, we have given you the biggest victory ever. A year later, Khaybar, another year later, they had the conquest of Mecca. So when I say to you again that, that victory is close, brothers and sisters, I'm not saying that from myself. I'm saying that because Allah has promised it. And we, our history shows us that as well. Further to that, if we continue, after the death of the Prophet wasallam, in the 11th day of the Hijrah in which the Prophet wasallam died, and there was no bigger calamity that took place to this Ummah than the death of the Prophet wasallam. Because the death of the, the Prophet wasallam, with him, there was wahi. There was communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was cut. And with the death of the Prophet wasallam, also we lost our leadership. Even though after we had leaders. But there was nothing like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So we lost the Prophet sallallahu Upon the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Anas ibn Malik, he makes an interesting quote. He said, Sirna, uh, he said, Lama mata Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Sirna kal ghanami ash-sharidi. That when the death of the Prophet sallallahu took place, we became scattered. As believers, we became scattered. And uh, one of the explanation of that is Abu Bakr, how long did he rule for over the Muslims? Roughly two years. Yeah? After the death of the Prophet, one of the biggest uh, catastrophes that took place was that the surrounding Muslims outside of Mecca, Medina and Ta'if, the surrounding Muslims, they became murtaddin. Many of them left Islam and many of them refused to give the zakat. And there was a big uh, liar who claimed to be a prophet. His name was Musaylim al kadhab So people even started to claim uh, prophethood. So the leader of the Muslims at that time, Bakr al-Siddiq, he was faced with a big issue. And this shows us the strength and the leadership of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. What did he do? Immediately, Abu Bakr, he gathered 11 armies. He formulated 11 armies and put somebody in charge of each one. And he sent them in these different directions. And it was soon after they all got they all came back into line. They all listened to what the armies had said and they all came back into line. So we find that the difficulties at that time, the calamity of the death of the Prophet and the breaking away of the Muslims, but then they came back uh, likewise. <coughs> One of the parties that showed hostility to the Prophet or even after the Prophet when he died, they thought it was an opportunity to strike back at the Muslims was what's known as Rum, which is modern day Europe. Rum, they thought this was a good time, and they were close by to a place called Yarmouk, and they thought that this would be a good time to attack the Muslims and to get rid of them. It is on this occasion that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, in line with the Prophet ﷺ, he sent an army to meet the people of Yarmouk. And who was the leader of the army? Yeah, Usama bin Zayd. And how old was Usama at this time? He was a teenager. He was a teenager. Abu Bakr said the biggest army in the hands of a teenager to go and fight Europe. Uh, and I brought this and I said this on purpose. Why am I saying this? Because look at the teenagers of that era and the teenagers of today. The teenagers of that time, they were empowered with leading armies. They were empowered with leading people. They were real men, you could say. And the youngsters of today, where do we stand? Yeah, so we need to check ourselves. So we find that... Uh, even this army that was sent un under the hands of Osama bin Zayd, actually the Romans didn't even, the Europeans, they didn't even turn up. Uh, so victory was achieved and uh, they came back with all of the booty. Further to that, uh, a few more instances from history. Further to that, brothers and sisters, moving on a lot further, we find another catastrophe that took place in the Ummah of Muhammad Wasallam, And that was the Crusades. The first crusade, which was at the hands of Raymond, who was sent by Pope Urban II in 1096. They left Europe and they went all the way to Jerusalem, yeah, to Masjid Al-Aqsa, the Holy Land, under the instructions of the Pope. They got to the Holy Land and it is said that the Crusaders, in the space of, and this is written in Western academia, not just Muslim sources, but in Western academic sources, that in the first week to 10 days of the Crusaders coming to Palestine or Jerusalem, that region there, up to 70,000 people were killed. Yeah? I'm not talking about a precision bomb as they do it today where you press a button and you kill 70,000. I'm talking that time, there was no bombs. So you're talking 70,000 people were taken out with the sword within the space of 10 to 15 days. The brutality was on another level. And Western academia itself notes that in the streets of Jerusalem, that people would walk and blood would reach up to their ankles. They didn't spare not just human beings, even animals were taken out, 
Even Christians that were different denominations were also killed because they were the same. The, the brutality was immense. And it wasn't long after, it wasn't long after, brothers and sisters, cutting a long story short, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent one of his awliya, one of the uh, wali, one of the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove the crusaders and to bring about victory in that place under the battle name of the battle of Hittin. Who was that man? Salahuddin al-Ayubi. Again, you would think, how is victory going to come? But Allah raised that man, nurtured that man, and he brought victory uh, to the people. I'll give you <coughs> one more story and then come to the concluding elements. In the 7th Hijri century, the Muslim world went through another great catastrophe. Um, and this was at the hands of the Tatar, or in other sources they call it the Mongols, who came from far east. And you know, some people, they thought they were the what? Yeah, they thought they were Juj yeah, Majuj because the, the level of killing they were doing, wherever they went, they killed everybody and everything. From all the way from Eastern Europe, all the way up until they reached to the doors of the Muslim world. And it is said that they went to Bukhara and they set it alight. They went to Samarkand and they destroyed it. They were the most brutal people to ever walk on this earth. Then when they came to Baghdad, it is said that when they entered into Baghdad for 40 days, they were able to do whatever they wanted. They raped, they pillaged, they killed, they burnt, they massacred. It was a 40 days of bloodshed. It was the worst days of Baghdad that's ever experienced. And they committed what they committed. And it wasn't long after, until at the Battle of Ain al Jalut in 1260, that a man under the name of Saifuddin Qutuz, he defeated the Mongols, and they were also put to arrest. So we find that, brothers and sisters, difficulties arise, and Allah, he brings about the victory. Allah, he promises victory, but we need to be patient and we need to have certainty in the fact that the victory will come. When we look at patience, one of the prophets we can look at to learn that patience is Nuh alayhi salam. 950 years, he was patient. Likewise, when we look at certainty, we look at Musa alayhi salam. You know, when Musa alayhi salam was stood in, in front of Pharaoh and Pharaoh had <coughs> up to 20,000 of the best magicians on one side, and Musa was on one side. And who did, who did Musa have with him? Just his brother Harun. That's it. Imagine that. Musa and Harun, 20,000 people in front of you. And you're going to compete to see who has got the strongest magic. At that time, even Musa's heart was shaking. But Musa alayhi salam, what did he say? Inna allaha sayubtiluhu. Because I'm certain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will destroy them. He said, I'm sure. Because it's not mine. I'm not doing something from myself. I'm doing it because Allah has inspired me. <coughs> Likewise, when Musa alayhi salam, he reached the edge of the Red Sea with his people. And Firaun was coming with his men. They couldn't go forward. They couldn't go right. They couldn't go left. And Pharaoh was getting closer and closer. The Bani Israel that were with Musa, what did they say to Musa? They said to him, فَلَمَّا تَرَاءَ الْجَمَعَانِ قَالَ أَصْحَابُ مُوسَىٰ إِنَّا لَمُدْرَكُونَ They said, oh Musa, you have brought us to this mess. Why did we listen to you? You brought us to this mess. We're all going to get killed now because of what you have done. What did Musa respond back with? He said, never. With me is Allah, and Allah will provide a way. And did he not provide them with a way? Of course he did. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he say to Musa? He said, take your staff, your stick, and do what with it? Hit the sea. Now again, any political analyst was to say that the biggest superpower army is behind you. There's only weak women and children here. You've got no weapons at all. You've got the sea in front of you. And now you're telling me to take my stick and to hit the sea. This guy is, is, is crazy. This is the, what is this? But he had certainty in Allah. So he took his stick and with certainty he hit the sea. And what happened to the sea? Split. Musa alayhi and his followers got to the other side. Pharaoh with his arrogance thought he'd get to the other side. But got to the middle. And Allah destroyed him. And how did Pharaoh die? With H2O, with water. وَمَا يَعْلَمُ جُنُودَ رَبِّكَ إِلَّا هُ Nobody knows Allah's soldiers except for Allah. The wind, the rain, the water, everything is in Allah's control. If Allah wants to bring about a, a, a storm, a flood, a rain, Allah can do what He wants whenever He wants. So we should not be people who just look at numbers, who just look at you know the rational arguments. Allah can do whatever He wants and He can turn things upside down whenever He wants. We must have belief in Allah and confidence in Allah because Allah is just. He is not unjust. Further to that, brothers and sisters, when we hear these things that I've made mention of, we ask ourselves the question, <coughs> what is it upon us to do as Muslims? 
Is it simply, as some may say, just make dua and just pray? Yes, we do pray, but is that all we must do? Or sometimes I've heard even some people say that be patient, the Mahdi is on his way. Do we just sit back and just wait for the Mahdi to come and fix all of our problems? No, the Mahdi is going to come. Isa al Islam, Jesus is going to return. That the Jal is also going to come. These are all prophecies. But these prophecies will happen when they're going to happen. We don't need to lie and bank on them. They're going to happen when they're going to happen. But you right now have a role and a task and responsibility today. Whether that's with the Mahdi or without the Mahdi. So those things are promised to us. But remember again, as I said, that Allah, He chooses His people. He chooses His place and He chooses the time. Now, brothers, is coming to the latter part of my, my discussion. <clears throat> what we see taking place around us in the world, the huge level of injustice that's taking place around the world, we can say something very clearly. And that is that the whole world, Muslim and non-Muslim, is screaming for justice. What we're seeing taking place around in front of our eyes today, we cannot fathom it, we cannot absorb it, we cannot digest it. It is a zulm, oppression on a level that we've never seen before. And the Muslim world, as well as the non-Muslim world, is screaming out for a more just way of life, a more superior way of life, not just just in its politics, not just just in its economics, but just in all aspects. You know, they say that, uh, you know, we live in a democracy, right? And in essence, there's nothing wrong with that, but the hypocrisy in the democracy is that democracy, they said, is the, the, the choice of the majority for the people. The people, they decide how they want to be governed, how they want to, be, how they want to live. Was it not the case that when uh, certain countries wanted to go and invade Iraq, that the majority of people came out and said, we don't want that to happen? Did they listen? They didn't listen. The majority won't listen to it. Uh, likewise, when we see the, uh, what is taking place in Gaza, the vast majority of the good people of this country and in other places have come out in the majority and said, we want a ceasefire. We want it to stop. Yet, when we look at the UN resolution, we find that all of the countries want a ceasefire, except for one. Constantly putting their hands up and vetoing the ceasefire. And that is the US administration. That we are told that we live in a democracy. We are told that majority rule is how we go. So if the majority asks for a ceasefire, why is there not a ceasefire? If the majority is asking for there to stop the bombing and the stopping of sales to this terrorist state, why isn't there a stop when the majority are asking? So there's hypocrisy in the democracy. A small group of people are able to dictate the actions of the world and the rest of us can only shout and scream and hope for something to take place, for something to change. So there is, brothers and sisters, a failure in the system. A failure in the political system, a failure even in the economical system. That we find that there has never been a greater gap between the wealthy and the poor than there is today. On the world today we find one group of people are dying of obesity, while another group of people have no access to water. Don't blame Allah and say Allah didn't give us enough food. Allah's given you enough food. The problem is you're greedy. And you've stored all of it for yourselves and left the other part of the world to starve. It's not Allah's fault. It's the way you govern your affairs. And the reason why I'm making mention of all of this, brothers and sisters, is because true justice on a political level, on an economical level, on a social level, is where? It's in the Quran. It's the book that you finished last night in prayer. You hold the solution to the world's problems, it's in your hands. The political solutions, the social solutions, the economical it's all there inside the Quran. It worked for the people before and I gave you loads of examples to prove that. And it can work again today. The problem is me and you. If Allah, he says, كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ That you are the best of people. But you've got to enjoy the good. And you've got to forbid the evil. And you've got to truly believe in Allah. If you do that, Allah says, He will make you the best of people again. The Qur'an holds the solutions. It's me and you that we think we're so pious that we put the Qur'an so high that we don't take it down. We think we're so religious and so good that we finish the Qur'an in Ramadan and then we don't touch it till next Ramadan. That's not the purpose of the Qur'an. The purpose of the Qur'an is meant to transform lives. It's meant to change the world. It's meant to take people, min dhulumati illa nur, take people out of darkness, of poverty, of injustice and bring them into light. That's what the Qur'an it promises. So we hold the solution. So we need to, number one, we need to understand what the Qur'an is saying. Reconnect with the Qur'an. Number two, for those amongst us, intelligent ones amongst us, we need to articulate those arguments that are inside the Qur'an, put it in a context in which the wider world, the western world and the eastern world can understand that we have real solutions. 
And I'm sure and I'm confident that when we present the Islamic solution academically and properly, the world will accept it. When people know that the, the economic system should be one which is not based on interest, it should be interest free. <laughs> who is not going to like that system? Every one of us or those of you who have monthly payments to make, when you have to pay those interest payments, it burns and kills you. And you'll be doing that for the next 30, 40 years of your life for those who are in that situation. Whereas Islam, it frees you from that. So we have an alternative and we have a better way of living. And I'm not saying that simply because I'm biased because I'm Muslim. I'm saying to you that because the Quran, it works. And the solutions that the, that the Quran provides, it works. On top of that, brothers and sisters, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent this ummah, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, me and you, to be leaders of this world. And hopefully you understand this point. I'll prove it to you. Out of all of the prophets, who is the best prophet? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And who was he sent to? He was sent to me and you. So Allah, he sent us the best of prophets. Out of all of the books, <coughs> divine revelation that was sent, which is the best? It is the Quran, because it's the only one that hasn't been changed. Not my words, you can ask the experts of the Bible, they will tell themselves the book has been changed. I'm not saying that, so it's not offensive. I'm saying the truth. Books have been changed. So the Quran, it is not, so we have the best of prophets, we have the best of books, and we have the best of nations, Allah he says. So if we have the best in ethics and morals and everything we have is the best, then why is it that the Ummah of Muhammad is at the bottom? You need to be at the top. Because if Allah has given you the best, he expects you to be the best. And if you're not the best, then you know we've got work to do. This is the role and the task. Now Ramadan, Ramadan is coming to an end. And in Ramadan, we are meant to be people who are meant to have come out of Ramadan transformed. Much closer to Allah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the end of the ayah, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That we are meant to attain taqwa. We're coming at the end of this month. We've spent time, we've devoted ourselves to salah devoted ourselves to sadaqah, devoted ourselves to prayer, Qur'an, we've been devoted, even food. SubhanAllah, we, at the end of the month we come to realize now that actually we don't need that much food. We come to realize that actually there's so much material possessions that I have at home, I don't even need them. This month I didn't even look at half of that stuff. Phones and, and, sh and I got 50 pairs of shoes and 30 pairs of this and I don't even need it. whole month went by and I didn't even open that part of the cupboard. So you don't need it. Our attachment to the dunya, we come to realize in Ramadan, actually we're far more attached to the world than we really need to be. When you can devote yourself to Allah in Ramadan like that, of course we don't have Taraweeh and Qiyamul Layl outside of Ramadan, it'll be too difficult. But the point Allah is trying to show you is that if you can do it for 30 days, you can still do it, maybe on that same level, on a lesser level, outside Ramadan. You can still devote yourself. And when you manage to gain that level of devotion and love and sacrifice for Allah, you can change the world. Because you're no longer attached, you're free. And you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you love the reward that you're getting for the sacrifices. So number one uh, lesson that we should learn from this, brothers and sisters, through the month of Ramadan, is that we, our iman, we should be reconnected with Allah, because if we want reform and we want change of this ummah, and that victory to come, number one is our iman. We have to be connected to Allah like the previous nations were. Number two, and I, I'll give you a quote actually, it's a very interesting quote. I've mentioned this before, but it's a very interesting quote. I'll leave you to think about it. That uh, uh, Aaron McKee makes this statement. He says, tough times create strong men. Strong men create easy times. Easy times create weak men. And weak men, they create tough times. So we're going through a tough time, which means we need strong men. Yeah? It's, uh, the good example is like you, as a father, you struggled all your life to give your children a house, education, so on and so forth. You went through the hardship. Now your son, he's coming, he's got a bit of ease. You are a stronger man, your son won't be that strong because he's got the luxuries. And that's how Allah SWT rotates the cycle. With hardship, you build real men. Number two, the second lesson that we should learn from Ramadan uh, in order for this revival or for us to stand on our two feet, brothers and sisters, a very important point is Muslim unity. In Ramadan, in these 30 days, have we not been united? You know when you're sitting there waiting to open your fast and you're literally looking at the seconds yeah, for you to open your fast and the brother next to you gives you a date to open your fast and I hope you can understand what I'm saying maturely those of you who are mature here the brother next to you gives you a date to open your fast do you say to the brother please what's your manhaj? brother what's your aqidah? or do you say barakallahu feek thank you very much let me have this date yeah? 
You take the day. Allah is teaching you, brothers and sisters, we have priorities in our deen. There will be differences, no problem. And we'll deal with those in due time. But at this moment in time, Muslim unity is very, very important with what's happening in the world. If you can do it in 30 days when you're praying, you don't look next to you and say, brother, what are you on? Brother, what are you on? You just sit there and you, you pray. And you open your fast. And you show love to one another. Look at the colors in this room. Look at the languages that come together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought us all together. It's Muslim unity. And with unity comes strength. With arguments and division comes weakness. And that's why Ramadan Allah is teaching us. And wallahi, I'll make a strong statement. Ramadan is not just a month of spirituality. Ramadan is a month of politics. You're going to say, what's this guy talking about? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing you, the, showing you and showing the world that we as Muslims are strong as an ummah. Just think about it. Over 2 billion people fasted. From Fajr up until Maghrib across the whole globe. You are doing the exact same action as a Muslim is, a Uyghur Muslim is doing in China. And what connects you to? La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. You doing the exact same action that a Muslim is doing in Central Africa. You've never seen that person, but were you doing it? Why? La ilaha illallah. This is unity on a level that you can't imagine. The, it's fine. Allah SWT is showing us that yes, it is a month of spirituality, but it's also a month of unity. Whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, we are one ummah. And our leader is Muhammad Sallallahu And our constitution is the Quran. And we promise you, not because of me again, because Allah promises that if you follow that constitution, you will see justice in this world. You will get spiritual success, you will have success in this world and success in the next world, but that is there. So Muslim unity, brothers and sisters, is very, very important. Number three also, in order for this revival, is knowledge. Because an ignorant nation can never stand. Knowledge, not just an Islamic knowledge, but knowledge in all aspects. We have to be educated people. We can't just remain ignorant. We have to go out there and learn. Whatever field you're in, become experts in that field and give your skills to the Ummah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because that's the only way a nation can rise through education. So we have to be people of education. Number four, and I'm coming towards the end now. Number four, as Muslims, hopefully through Ramadan, we've been very active. I think I'll speak for most people and I don't feel shy to say it, but now we're coming towards the 28th night of Ramadan and you may be feeling a little bit of pain in your lower spine. Your knees might be crackling a little bit. You may have lost your sleep pattern. You may have even lost your bathroom pattern. Everything's all over the place. Huh? <laughs> but this is Ramadan. Allah is teaching us that we can do it. Right? It can happen. Things are all over the place. But we are we're functioning. We are much more active. We are achieving more things. What this teaches us is that, brothers and sisters, that we need as an ummah to remain to be active. Outside of Ramadan, we need to be active. Not just in our worship, which is also very important, but in all aspects. We need to be people to understand that we are people of action. And again, I'm going to say something. Hopefully you can understand me for those who are mature. That the worship of Allah is not only inside the masajid. That's a statement. If you understand what I said, you understood what I said. The worship of Allah is not just done inside the masajid. This is the best place to worship Allah. But the worship of Allah is done even outside. The worship of Allah is done at your workplace. The worship of Allah is done when you're walking down the road. The worship of Allah is done even in the House of Parliament. The worship of Allah is done everywhere. And when you start worshipping Allah like that, that's when you are truly وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That is the true worship of Allah. Because you are bringing Allah's deen into reality, into real life, which Allah, He wants you uh, to do. So brothers and sisters, to conclude, that as Muslims, we need to be far more active. Active when it comes to da'wah. Active when it comes to politics. Active when it comes to even finance. As, as a community, as if we want to revival, we have to be wealthy people. We have to be people that earn money. I know some people give an impression of Islam that the poorer you are, the more your clothes are torn, the better and more pious you are. I don't know where that comes from. Because when you look at the companions of the Prophet, and many of them were multi-millionaires. Abu Bakr was rich, Umar was rich, Abdul Rahman ibn Auf was rich. They were wealthy people. Uthman ibn Affan funded the whole battle. They were, they were wealthy people. Islam encourages us to be wealthy, but earn it in a halal way, not haram way. Islam encourages us to be healthy because without money, you can't fund campaigns. Without money, you can't go for hajj. Without money, you can't go to university. So we need to be a, a community that is wealthy. So you need to get into work. Set up businesses. Become wealthy people. But then when you get that money, don't uh, forget about Islam. You have to contribute that money to Islam and support the projects. So we need to be people that are engaged on all levels. <coughs> and we need to be people that are also socially more active as well. 
in simple things, you know, meeting your neighbor, uh, going to the local library, setting up places where you can have tea and coffee. Just let people see you that Muslims, we're real, genuine people and we're caring people. We don't mean you no know, harm. We mean nothing but love, peace and prosperity to all people, Muslim and non-Muslim. So be much more engaged. Inshallah ta'ala, brothers and sisters, we'll stop. There's much more to be said, but uh, I'm conscious of time. It is seven o'clock. So inshallah, we'll stop there. اللهم اجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه أبناتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم إن نسألك فإلى الخيرات وترك المنكرات وحب المساكين وأن تغفر لنا يا أرحم الراحمين وأن تتوب علينا يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اغفر لنا وارحمنا وأعتق رقابنا من النار اللهم عز الإسلام والمسلمين يا اللهم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم إنا نعوذ بك من قلب لا يخشع ومن علم لا ينفع ومن نفس لا تشبع ومن دعوة لا يستجاب له اللهم عز الإسلام المسلمين اللهم انصر إخواننا في مسجد الأقصى اللهم كن لهم ولا تكن عليهم اللهم انتقم من أعدائهم واقذف الرعب في قلوبهم ورد كيدهم في نحورهم اللهم اللهم أصلح حوال المسلمين في كل مكان اللهم أصلح قادتهم وعلماءهم وشبابهم ونساءهم اللهم أصلح حوال المسلمين في كل مكان اللهم يا ربنا تقبل منا صيامنا وقيامنا ورقوعنا وسجودنا يا الله الله اللهم أعتق رقابنا من النار اللهم أعتق رقاب والدينا من النار اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد بارك الله فيكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته